I have a presentation to share. I tend to get a little passionate. Um, and my intention today is to actually keep it somewhat light and just kind of share. Um, and for you guys, just know that I don't potentially believe anything that I'm saying. Okay. I'm just sharing it for fun. That's it. Okay. This is just a fun conversation. And I just want you to ask yourself the question consistently. What if, what if there's a lot more going on in the cosmos than what we're aware of? And what if there's a lot more to our history than we're aware of? And what if truth is actually stranger than fiction? And there is a level of me that believes that that is exactly the truth. That, truth, that our truth of our history is much stranger than what we've ever been told. And if we actually knew the truth of our history, we'd be so inspired about who we are and who our ancestors are and our capabilities as humans. It might just spark us into a direction of doing so much more if we knew our potential for capacities moving forward in this life. But because the time, by the time we're born and moving up and growing up in this world, we're just told this is your box. You need to fit in it. This is how long you're going to live. This is what you're capable of. And if you get great A's, maybe you can get a good job or have a good career and be a good little sheeple. But outside of that, there's nothing and don't think otherwise. So um, what I'm going to be presenting is something coming up called the Jedi Training. The Jedi training sounds very much like Jedi from Star Wars for a reason, but the original name of these advanced individuals that were tapped in to something more were called the Jedi, and this is very clear in the ancient Egyptian writings and wisdom. There are papyrus that talk about these individuals, and I, would, I just want to get into it. Before again, before I go off ranting, I just want to go through a little bit of who I am, a little bit of background, who my teachers are, what I've been doing, uh, and open up possibilities. Uh, just on this pillar here uh, was one of the original teachers uh, called Thoth in ancient Egypt. How many of you have heard of Thoth? Okay. And some would call him Thought. And it's believed that that's where thought comes from, because thought or thought was one of the original teachers of all the wisdom schools. He wrote books on mathematics and language and astronomy and music and so many different things and was a teacher of humanity. Now, you know, we're taught that, you know, oh, well, the Egyptians worship these weird gods with animal heads, and we're not really sure why. Um, and it's it's very unfortunate because it's complete bullshit. OK, the Egyptians didn't worship a bunch of different gods. The Egyptians didn't worship cats. Now, I can't speak for the Ptolemaic period and the end of Egypt once Egypt had already fallen, which most of the information that we receive about ancient Egypt was after 600 B.C. And we need to understand that Egypt was invaded by the Persians and the Syrians, and then eventually the Romans and the Greeks and all the others. But the main invasion happened in around 600 BC. And around that time, the true uh, ancient Egyptian wisdom holders and teachers, sages and immortals, I would call them, took the actual truth of the teachings underground. And they actually closed the pyramid complex. And the pyramid complex serves a very specific purpose. Okay, and everybody always talks about, oh, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. It's pretty obvious to me, and I don't know if in this presentation I'll be able to make it obvious to you, but I'll tell you what it is, and I'll show you some design work of the pyramid and what it was actually used for, and you guys can make up your own minds about it. And, of course, whenever you have something of that size, there's potential for multiple uses. But this guy was called Hermes Trismegistus. He was given the name Hermes by the Greeks. They deified him as Hermes. And Hermes is this guy who wielded something called the caduceus wand. Anybody, you guys know what the caduceus is? 
the caduceus is this pole with these snakes that go up it and then it has wings and that's what's used by the pharmaceutical industry in the medical system so if you ever go to a doctor or you go to a hospital you'll see this caduceus wand which is a, a symbol of what hermes held okay hermes trismegistus tris stands for three magistus stands for magi and so you can look this up in history this guy hermes trismegistus called hermes by the greeks was thrice great and the thrice great referred to the fact that his name was tehuti or some say tehote of ancient atlantis okay so he was one of the highest physicians and teachers in Atlantis, which was an advanced civilization prior to Egypt. This is where all of the most advanced teachers and leaders of Egypt came, sorry, of Atlantis came to Egypt and established the pyramid complex far, 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 long, 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 long before what we are told. Okay. So he's referred to as Tehote, high physician of ancient Atlantis. In Egypt, he was called Thoth. And then he was also called Hermes. I'm just sharing a little bit as I go. So the sources of my education and ancient Egyptian influence, number one, are my father, Don Tolman. Uh, from the time I was a kid, just so you guys are aware, I was not raised with or around my father. Uh, I didn't know much about him other than he was this super ecstatic, energetic, glowing amazing man that would come and visit you know for a week or two out of the year and when he was around he was just a total inspiration he took us out doing fun things you know taught us what he could in that little amount of time and then would leave again and then it wasn't until i was 13 years of age that my mother actually allowed me to go and stay with my father and i stayed with my father for three months during the summer and I was exposed to a completely different way of living. My father had a 200 acre farm. He had peacocks and swans and ducks, and there were cattle on his ranch, if you want to call it that, or farm. Uh, he had horses. Um, I actually spent the summer breaking horses. Um, if you know what that process is like, it's not easy. I did it by myself when I was 13 years of age uh, because I wanted to ride the horses. And I said, dad, how do I ride the horse. And he's like, well, son, they're wild horses. So what you're gonna have to do is get out some grain, put it next to the fence, get a rope, tie it up and go through the process. And it took me nearly three weeks to be able to ride the horse without it bucking me off and nearly breaking my arm and taking me off under the trees and doing all these things. So there was a lot that I learned uh, being out on this farm and being in nature. My father grew most of his own food had his own water source, and lived very differently. There was always juicing and eating raw foods and living a completely different lifestyle. And after about a month, uh, a bunch of people showed up that were sick. And he spent quite a long period of time facilitating fasting and major detoxification for people with chronic disease. And he would give discourses outside and talk about what he had learned traveling the world for 17 years and talking about ancient Egypt was a big part of that and how the ancient Egyptian physicians had very specific ways to bring about situations of healing. And one of those obviously incorporated fasting. So my father inside of our house had these big uh, like oak wooden chests with glass that were beautiful. Uh, we called them curios. And inside of those, he had ancient Egyptian artifacts from his travels. He spent 17 years traveling the world, learning languages, doing different things, being inspired. And his mission in life actually was to learn a lot about human health and why we're here and what we're here to do. But a big part of it was an ancient meal called pulse that was talked about in the Old Testament of the Bible. If you read uh, the first chapter of Daniel, it talks about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego eating this food called pulse for three years and after a period of three years appearing to be 10 times more intelligent and stronger and having all these gifts of dreams and wisdom and things that uh, ended up becoming useful with King Nebuchadnezzar and took them into some pretty amazing adventures. So that was one of the stories that inspired my father and that's essentially he was searching for this sacred meal called Pulse. Eventually found out that 
Hercules uh, actually was the originator of this food. Um, and he learned about it from a specific source. Um, and then later on down the track, it was called the, the meal of Hercules. And I have very specific records in my own library of Pythagoras specifically mentioning and talking about the exact ratios of this food called the meal of Hercules, which Daniel called pulse. And if you look into history, you'll find out that Daniel was thrown in prison. Well, same thing happened with another individual at the same time, and maybe they shared information. So Don, my father, was the original source of my inspiration around ancient Egypt. And I know that, I don't know if, if any of you guys ever had this experience where you've seen like ancient Egyptian logos or writing or just images of anything ancient Egypt and just felt like, wow, like, what is this? Anybody ever have that feeling inside, like super attracted to that? Anyone? One person? Awesome. <laughs> That's great. One person is excited. So for me, that's just what I felt. Okay, we got a couple people here. So I've always had this connection. And I've always wanted to learn the language. And I've always wanted to know more about the truth. And my father had books eventually that I stole out of his safe. My father used to have this massive safe. I actually just bought one and it arrived today, actually. <laughs> it's kind of funny I'm talking about it. But he had this massive safe with a big handle on the front. You'd open it up. And besides the gold and silver and cash that he had stacked, he had his books, books that he had handwritten over time. And this is like my father going out on 40-day water fasting experiences and having downloads. Uh, my, feet, my father, and I'm just going to say it. I'm not going to hold anything back. My father remembered his past lives, okay, and he had visions, and different masters came to him in the physical, and he called these masters immortals. And these immortals were individuals who had ascended to such a point that they could walk through time and space. But they would never just contact ordinary human beings because it'd be like putting, you know, it'd be like putting some 100,000 watt generator in the room with a fork. And it would just create, you know, some kind of experience where it wouldn't actually work for the average human. But when you go through advanced processes of detoxification and purification and raising your vibration to a certain point, these immortals can lower their vibration enough to come and actually have an experience of a conversation and share information with you. And so over the period of five years in a row, doing a 40-day water fast and going deep into these experiences, my father would have these immortals come to him and give him information about life and where we're from and history and where we're going and so many different things. And so as I pulled these journals out of my dad's uh, safe that he didn't share with anyone, like this is the most sacred of his texts and work. He didn't publish this information this is like his personal journals that he didn't even share with me. I just happened to find his safe open in his office one day and stole the books out of there and went and would spend countless nights doing my best to read as much as I could before he found out and freaked out that I had taken his books. And eventually I put them back. Um, and, you know, I'll talk about memory at some point because the way memory works, mem means water, ori means light. The way memory works is that when we can calm the waters of the brain, house of rain, enough and purify the waters and see the reflection of the past, which is what's happening inside of our brain, when I can reflect upon the past, anything that I have seen or experienced at any point in my entire lifetime can be perfectly recalled, meaning I can rewind to the time I can see it, I can feel, I can smell, and I can rehab the experience if I do what it takes to improve my memory to that point, okay? And I can tell you this with full confidence because in my 20s, I went and did the extended fasting and was able to gain the ability of reviewing my life and going back to the sixth grade and fourth grade and third grade and second grade and first grade, and even to the time of being a baby, 
and having being able to fully recall everybody's names in my class, the teacher, be able to actually be in my body as if I was there and remember and saying my school song and pledge of allegiance and like all of it legit, like able to open up my desk and have a look and see what was in there. And so at some point, the reason I'm saying this is at some point through my own advanced level of adopting these skills and getting back into this, which I haven't done for a few decades. I've been so caught up in teaching and traveling and building a business and making a life and having kids and doing things as we do uh, that I haven't really been fully committed to the process. At some point when I am, what I'm saying is I'll be able to go back and review the journals of my father's that I stole and then rewrite everything that he wrote and be able to publish his work. Okay, so that was a little off track. Anyways, I'm super excited by the ancient Egyptian. Eventually, my, my wish for higher learning of the ancient Egyptian traditions brought me to this man. His name is Dr. Ramsey Salim. And there was a woman that I call my oracle. Her name is Lisa. And I call her my oracle because she just, for decades, just sends me random messages like, hey, Tyler, look into this thing. Hey, Tyler, I'm feeling this thing coming up and check this out. And it's always like right on point with where I'm at and what I'm looking for and what's going on. And she gave me this book. She sent me this book. Uh, it's called Ancient Egyptian Natural Medicine. Okay. And there's that caduceus that I speak of. Okay. That's the wand of Hermes, the caduceus. And this is about a process of purification and opening of the seven seals of the body and awakening so that we have wings. And this is the actual medical symbol. Uh, this is the translation of the Hennifer papyrus and also the Edwin Smith papyrus. This is the ancient Egyptians physician manual. Okay. So she gave me this book and this book is man on every type of healing modality and face reading and how to read the hands, pulse reading, um, how the body works, why we have 33 vertebrae and 33 sutures in the skull and how the lungs work. And the, not just the physical, but the energetic, there's so much of this book. And yet she gave me this book and this book sat on a shelf and I used to run these extended fasting programs in Bali. And when I was running these fasting programs, I'd get all my books out and I'd just lay them out and be like, Hey, you guys are fasting. Anytime you just want to grab a book, come grab a book, open it up, read it. Feel free to take it back to your room, check it out. And one day I grabbed that book off of the bed and I thought, Oh, it's kind of a, a shame. You know, this woman gave me this book and I've never actually read it. You know, I did open it up before, read through it a little bit, but just wasn't the timing. Anybody ever have that experience where, you know, you have this amazing book, but you just can't read it because it's not the right time. And so I just opened this book to a random page and I, I could actually open the book now to that page. And some of you might be absolutely inspired by what it says, but I just read this single paragraph and my whole body was just like, goosebumps and just like, oh my God, that is one of the highest truths I've ever heard. And I just know it all in my soul that it's true. And holy shit, I need to read this book. And this was during one of my fasting programs. So after the fasting program finished, I did exactly that. Because every time I ran a program, I'd take a couple of days off afterwards. I was like, you know what? I'm going to open this book and actually read it. And then I knew straight away Whoever is whoever wrote this book is someone I need to be in contact with. So I immediately contacted this place called Sia Academy, siaacademy.com, and contacted Dr. Ramsey Salim. And he was running a program, a 10-day program in London, teaching the ancient Egyptian wisdom and the ancient Egyptian physical culture, history, mystery, religion, all this sort of stuff. And so, you know, I paid couple thousand, three, four thousand pounds, and then bought an airline ticket and decided I was gonna, that's what I was going to go out and do. And it was a transformational experience, to say the least. <laughs> this guy spoke in the actual tongue of the true ancient, it's called Medu Netru, the language of nature, which is, you know, he can read and write and actually speak the language of the ancient Egyptians, which is completely a lost language. 
We need to understand that the Egyptologists of today that have deciphered the Meru Netru or language of nature uh, have done a great job, but they are also completely wrong. Uh, there's a lot of big pieces that are missing. And so when you read a translation by some of the greatest Egyptologists of, let's say, like the book of coming forth by day, which they call the book of the dead, very different definition. Book of the dead versus the book of coming forth out of the night into the day, out of the darkness and into the light is the name of the actual book. Um, when you read some of the descriptions that Dr. Salim has translated, it speaks to your soul and you're moved. And it's like, wow, our ancient, ancient ancestors were tapped into something great. And then when you read the Egyptological definition, you're just like, oh, what the hell are they talking about? Does it really make sense? And it's unfortunate because present day Egyptology and scientists and historians would have you believe that the ancient Egyptians were you know, just kind of a dumb culture worshiping animals and somehow were able to build the great pyramids and temples and some of the most fantastic artwork and statues and building of all time. But they were still just, you know, kind of primitive people using chisels and things of that nature. So these are the two main sources. And obviously, when I came into this source, uh, it was a direct lineage source somebody who had received it over a lifetime. And it really ignited uh, my soul towards the ancient Egyptian wisdom. And I ended up going to Egypt a couple of different occasions. One of those occasions was taking an entire group of people there. And what I have to say is when I really open up and if we have the chance to really go deep on the ancient Egyptian wisdom, then go to Egypt it's a completely different experience because when you're there looking at the tools and the pieces and the great pyramids and the, the depth of the capacity of these individuals, you will know all through your soul, the bullshit the Egyptologists are telling you is exactly that. It's just complete nonsense. It's almost just like a, a cover Egyptology. Who's ever even heard of any other form of archaeology, you know, other than archaeology. Egyptology was specifically formed in conjunction with the CIA. You look into Dr. Hawass. I sat and had dinner with a guy, had deep discussions with Dr. Hawass, who's the curator of antiquities and the one that manages everything. Find out where he went to school and who he was interacting with. The whole Egyptological thing is a cover to just completely suppress the truth of what's really going on. And whenever there's new discoveries, they make sure they get rid of anything and hide anything that exposes the actual truth. But I will tell you to this day, I'm actually very surprised because there has been some discoveries that they openly talk about. And even that in the last couple of years, they're starting to now openly talk about some things that are like, wait a second. How can you even be saying this? Because it changes everything else that you guys have already said. And you're basically saying that you've lied to everybody. And I'll get into a little bit of that as well. I just want to share a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a little bit of an adventure junkie. Um, I've been just an energetically charged human being since birth. Um, I've come into this life with a, a very high midichlorian count. Uh, which I'll talk about also a little bit later and how to improve the midichlorian count of your body. Um, but yeah, tapped in and gifted in certain ways and also denying certain things. I had an experience when I was very young of using one of these gifts that maybe some other people have tapped into before, and it scared the shit out of me. I'll be completely honest. Um, I was raised a Christian and I went to church. My mom took us to church every Sunday and I was devout and I would pray and I believed in Jesus and the whole thing. And I'm not saying I don't now. Okay. But I was raised in a certain way. So when all of a sudden these gifts started to come through, um, it made me have the feeling like maybe I was doing something bad. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't mean to go off too much, but I, I had the feeling like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I'm evil if I do this. And I would pray to God that 
you know, I was good and didn't do it again. <laughs> and the problem is when you judge yourself and certain gifts that you have as bad, you potentially suppress them. And it might take a lot uh, to bring those types of things back to the forefront. Um, but yeah, as you can see, I love jujitsu. I love martial arts. Um, I've done a couple different forms of martial arts. When I was a kid, I was a natural wrestler and, and fighter. Uh, my brother was two and a half. I always joke and say two and a half years older than me. I'm missing a digit, by the way. Uh, I lost that digit when I was two and a half. Legit. All right, maybe two and a third, actually. Uh, I lost that digit on an escalator in SeaTac Airport. Um, but yeah, I always was wrestling and fighting with my older brother and his friends. I was always just a tough little kid that was always asking for it. You know, my brother was, was the tough one on the, in the neighborhood and he had lots of friends and I was always egging him on just to wrestle and fight. Uh, so I always just had this energy in me. I've always loved bikes, motorbikes, um, anything that's like full Jedi experience. You know, I've, I've raced like street bikes up canyons, you know, close calls, nearly dying, doing 130, 150 miles an hour, popping wheelies down highways in my twenties, you know, anything and everything that is a bit scary, but you know, you can get good at and just trust and have this feeling. I feel like I've always had guardian angels because there's no way I would be alive today if I didn't have guardian angels or some form of like internal force and foresight to avoid certain really bad situations. You know, early on in life, I did create a bit of negative karma for myself which I think I, I took a lot of time reversing that negative karma by being of service and doing good in the world. I've dedicated my life to being of service. Uh, but yeah, I love skydiving. I love martial arts. I love, I love martial arts weapons as well. So when we say weapon, you know, a lot of people might freak out by that, but it's like, it's a tool that you can play with. So the bow staff is one of my favorites. When I first found the bow staff, this large, heavy stick and realized that I could spin it and move my body and run, run along the beaches of California and throw it in the air and play with it. I just love the experience and the feeling of moving my body and using some type of tool, not for fighting, but just for like exercise and awareness of time and space. And eventually I did what's called the double staff. So this is two long staffs with Kevlar and soaked in fuel and you light it on fire, and then I would do fire spinning. And I did something called the chain whip, this massive chain with a big tool on the end of it that you can wrap around your body and move, and then I'd get some that you can light on fire. I'd do staff, I'd do double staff, I'd do swords, and I'd get on stage in California uh, in front of big parties and groups of people and, and perform uh, these types of things. And it just, something about it lit my soul on fire. And eventually, I believe that this unlocks certain aspects of our own brain and it balances the brain hemispheres and opens up our capacity for the understanding of time and space and movement, which are very important. And you can start out little by little. I don't care who you are, how old you are. You can get a broomstick. You can start with a little closet dowel and just start moving it. And it trains your brain in certain ways that will prevent Alzheimer's and dementia and decay of our gray matter. Anyways, I am ranting quite a bit. So these are the couple of tours that I went on. This is the one I went on with my father back in 2013. And then I ended up running my own program in Egypt uh, back in about 2017, 2018. Amazing experiences. And I was only touching on starting these rituals and processes of awakening so that when you go into the temples, there's an initiation process that takes place. There are 13 temples along the Nile, and whether you're aware of it or not, by going into the temples, there's an actual genetic uh, upgrade that takes place. Just by being in the location and walking through the portals, essentially, that they've set up in these locations. And of course, you know, thousands of years ago, not any random individual could just walk into these places. Um, but there is a, a process that you can go through while you're there. And I'm looking forward to in the future, 
really getting people the right information and education and getting them to upgrade and then going into these spaces with a, a specific intention. Okay. Uh, this is a fasting program with 10 uh, of my soul brothers all together. Um, and this is, you know, the ultimate thing that I love is bringing together and going through the process of awakening. And then through the process of awakening, we go through the purification. And there's a serious upgrade that takes place in conversations and heart opening that can happen unlike anything you will ever experience. When you get together with other individuals in like-minded uh, process of healing and rejuvenating and opening, it's a pretty amazing experience, whether it's women and men, all women getting together, all men getting together. These are traditions that have been lost, that have been around for thousands of years, which is why human beings are so disconnected and why we don't truly know ourselves because we don't have these initiatory types of processes and experience that awaken us to so much more of who we are and our potential. When I was at Calm Ombo back in 2013, you know, nine years ago, the priest who was there just hiding behind this little area came out with this key and handed it to me. <laughs> He just like came out and he handed me this key, which is an onk, which I've been wearing an onk ever since that time that I was given this onk, also called the key of life. Yes, I love it. Love it, Michael. Uh, it's It was called the ank or onk or ankus, and there's different pronunciations, but there's symbology of what this is and what it does. And essentially, this applies to the human experience. It's an energy process that we can actually go through. Let's take a deep breath. Let it out. Grab a drink. So my teacher taught me a process and it's a basic process of human evolution as it was taught by the ancient the Jedi masters. And it's a process you'd have to go through if you chose to be an initiate. An initiate was somebody who decided to go on to a different path, not just a regular path of, you know, having a family and growing some food and just kind of being a part of society and doing whatever you want. The initiatory path was somebody who was committed to soul evolution within this lifetime. And it was taught that you could use this lifetime to potentially perform the work of many lifetimes and go through this process, essentially, that was called ascension. So I'm just going to walk us through it. I'll try to be fairly quick, not spend too much time, but to truly know ourselves in our place in the cosmos and evolve, there is a three-step process. Now, the book that I mentioned before called The Book of Coming Forth by Day, or Coming it Out of Night into the Day, teaches us that society in general is asleep. Okay? And we hear people all the time, oh, wake up, wake the F up, man. Don't be a sheeple. Wake up, wake up, wake up. And of course, there are different degrees of awakening and becoming aware. But in general, these guys are talking about a whole nother level of awakening, not just like becoming aware that there's fluoride and chlorine in your water and there's pesticides and herbicides and artificial colors and sweeteners and shit that's poisoning you, that's shutting off your natural capacities and abilities and over time causing cancer and heart disease and all these problems. That's one level of awakening for sure. And that's what I've dedicated my life to is educating people about how to not poison themselves and then go through a process of detoxification, because ultimately, if I can just teach people from a health teacher perspective, eventually they'll wake up and start to figure things out for themselves. But there was a specific process. So the ancient Egyptians said, one way to wake up is to get into the presence of a master. Okay, a master is someone who has evolved enough that they are activated okay and these are the teachers these are the inspired ones these are the people that typically you're going to see on stage that many people gather around 
and they're teaching something and they're, they're living by inspiration and they are activated. So by being in the presence of a master alone wakes you up in time because the master has a field that is at such a higher vibration that anybody who is asleep that comes into their space can't help it. They will start to vibrate on the same frequency. They'll start to have their own aha moments and start to change their lifestyle and everything about them because of being in that consistent energetic field. Okay. And some of you may be these masters and people already, and you'll know or have a feeling an essence of when you get around to certain people and they become your friend, there's like this natural upgrade awakening process that happens when people are around you. Okay. But they had a very specific definition of master. They said the, another way you can wake up is by the ancient Egyptian physical culture. So the physical culture was a five aspect process of stretching and moving and breathing and postures and strength training and martial arts. And they taught a very specific process that you would do every day. And if you research people like Herodotus, the great historian of the Greeks, he traveled to Egypt. He came back and reported because he reported on every surrounding country, typically negative things. But he came back from Egypt and said the Egyptians are the healthiest, the happiest, and the most religious of any other nation. And when he said most religious, he was saying that because every day they would all wake up before sunrise and go through very specific rituals of stretching and moving and breathing and postures and, and movement. Okay. And of course, there were different levels depending on the individuals and what they were doing, but physical culture has the power to wake you up. And whether you're aware of the specific physical culture or not, athletes have a level of awakening that takes place because they're so committed to the physical aspect of life. So people who are marathoners and at triathletes and all these types of things, there's a level of awakening inside of their body that takes place. Now, the ancient Egyptians believed you could either wake up through the master, through the physical culture, or through trauma and disaster, which means if you don't get into the presence of a master or be about a physical level of culture to wake you up, eventually you'll be woken up by trauma and disaster. And for some people, this has happened in their lives where they're just working their jobs or kind of doing their thing, a little bit lost, or maybe just not really sure. And then all of a sudden, a major car accident, or all of a sudden, somebody close to them dies, or all of a sudden, their wife or partner cheats on them, or something huge happens, and they have this awakening. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Awakening, or tornado hits, or a major earthquake, or your house burns down, or something, and all of a sudden, it's like this awakening is like, oh my God, and you typically have this review process of like, what have I been doing and what's been going on in my life? And maybe I need to do so much more. But if you don't know the next step, most people will just go back to sleep. They'll end up just getting another job, doing the regular thing and kind of like not really figuring it out. But the Egyptians knew that once you have the awakening, it's important to step into the process of purification. Okay. And they had a very specific process of purification that would take you to a level of what they called activation. And activation was a level of your own genes, your 12 strand DNA starting to become more active and vibrating in a unified way to fulfill more of the blueprint of who you are actually, who you are actually and what you're meant to be doing. And so typically through these major purification processes, people are guided to a space of doing what they're really meant to be doing and becoming fulfilled and fulfilling their purpose within it. And that's the activation process. Then we need to understand that there's a whole new level of awakening that takes place and then a new level of purification and another level of activation probably at least of which there are seven major activations that need to take place on this plane. 
of existence. And we'll get into this and we'll get into the connection between the ancient Egyptian side of things and this movie called Star Wars. Because George Lucas was somebody who was in contact with one of these initiates who shared our true history in depth. And George Lucas was inspired by this and started to do more research, thinking and feeling into it. But then over time, actually started to write the movie and invested 100% of every ounce of his being into getting this information into the consciousness of human beings again, so that we could awaken. And when people watch these movies where there are some of these people that are behind the scenes trying to get the information in through Hollywood, it's not all bad. It's good and bad. There's a lot of both sides, but these movies are designed to reawaken something inside of you to get you to step into your true potential. So I want to talk about this thing called the Dejed Pillar. The Dejed is one of the more ancient and commonly found symbols in Egyptian mythology. It is a pillar-like symbol in hieroglyphs representing stability. It is associated with Ptah, who was the original builder of the Great Pyramid and the Pyramid Complex, along with the other guy that I mentioned, Thoth or Tehuti. Tehote and Ptah built the pyramids and the Sphinx, com Sphinx complex at least some 36,000 BC. And that's the truth. And that's the truth as it's portrayed by my teachers. It's the truth as it's written in a book called the Emerald Tablets, which was a translation by a man by the name of Doriel of the actual Emerald Tablets, which you guys can go and read because it's exactly in alignment with what my teacher teaches. So this Dejed pillar represents stability. It represents, it represents uprightness. There are four aspects of the Dejed pillar that need to become awakened and activated and built within us to truly do what was called the, it was basically called raising the Dejed pillar within yourself. Then there are a couple of other tools that are used in conjunction. And when you look back at the ancient Egyptian individuals, you'll see specific tools with certain individuals, almost like badges. So you can see individuals who were performing certain works and the other individuals who had multiple. And then only very few of the Jedi actually had this symbol included with all of it. Because it was the rare few, a few there be that find it, air, fire, earth, and water. Some of these four aspects of raising the pillar that truly made it to the highest levels that were referred to as the Jedi. And this is the ultimate symbol here. So this was called the Uaz Scepter or Wasti. The Uaz Scepter was called the Scepter of Power. Okay. All of these things, by the way, overlay on the human body, and the human body is these things, okay? But remember, as within, so without. We can learn by things that are happening inside of us how to design and create things outside of us. And in fact, the entire pyramid was built on the sacred geometry and mathematics of the human body, okay? It's one of the most perfect buildings that is a representation of the human body in some of its aspects and some of the greatest temples ever built, the temple of Luxor. If you go back and read uh, Schwaller de Lubitz, the, the temple in man, massive volumes of this architectural builder who spent nearly two decades living at Luxor, learning from the local people and measuring every inch of Luxor Temple, having been around the world and seen all the greatest works of all time, said the, the temple at Luxor is the most fantastic building on planet Earth. And every aspect was directly linked to the human body in very specific ratios. And I have his massive set of books in Bali still. But essentially, we can see this all put together. This is the Ankh, which is the key of life. The Uwa's scepter, which is the scepter of power. 
and the Dejed pillar, which represents stability. So it's like stability, power, and life. And this also represents regeneration. So what is a Dejedi? They were considered to be the highest order of healers, teachers, warriors, and magicians. Some of them cho chose the warrior and magician pathway. Some of them chose the healers and teacher pathway. It was almost like there was two separate divisions. Okay. So within the school, you could choose the path of healer and teacher and go out and just teach the healing arts and how to regenerate and heal. This has been my pathway. Okay. And I've been invited into the warrior magician side of things. And at the time, many years ago, no way, not a chance. I was not ready. And I didn't want to have anything to do with this. And I'll explain a little bit more at a later time. But I'm coming to a point of being ready to step into this right-hand path. Okay, there's a left-hand path, the feminine, and a right-hand path, the masculine. And I've embraced my whole life. Of course, I've always loved this, but fully embraced this and to do this for a living. There are a few surviving writings about these uh, about them. The West Car Papyrus is one of them. So you can actually go into and read the traditional uh, Egyptological definitions of the translations. And it talks about the Jedi being very powerful warrior and magician class and the things that they did. The problem is Egyptology reads that and they're like, oh, well, this must just be stories that they told children for fun, you know, because you can't do that. And so they just disregard all of these things. And in fact, if you look at the Turin papyrus and the king's list of Manetho and all these others, you'll discover that Egyptologists know the Egyptians had the most profound system of writing and documenting in time every single month, every year, the alignment of the stars, everything. So everything they wrote, they say, is exactly the way things happen because it's all documented back some 5,000 BC, but then what? Because the records go on tens of thousand years prior to that. Tens of thousands of years. So why do they disregard that? Why do, what, and what, you, what you'll see is they accept all of this as being absolute fact and truth. And then at this one point, they say, oh, that's mythology. Why? And the sole reason for that is the time frame of the, the birth and death of the individuals prior to this time. Because prior to this time, individuals, Ptah, for example, the first ruler of Egypt, the one that built the pyramid complex, is on the king's list as the first king of Egypt and ruled for 9,000 years. Oh, so we just can't accept that? That's just mythology. That just must have been one of their gods that they worshipped. And so they said that he ruled for 9,000 years. Well, wait a second. I thought you just said Egyptians had the most clear understanding of time and recording and all of this. Is that true or no? Yeah, but of course, once we hit this point, they just get all crazy with saying people live 9,000 years, 5,000 years, 350 years. And we just can't accept that. Well, you also can't accept the fact that even to this day, you couldn't build a pyramid or anything even close to it with its precision and size, period. So maybe these people knew or had technology outside of what you actually know, and you should just accept it all as truth. Because the way science actually works, and you can study science, if you find a civilization that has more information and knowledge than you do that you can prove is true, then you have to accept it as truth. That's the current scientific literature, but they don't follow it because they just can't accept it because science isn't actual science, it's religion. Our current science that we call, we think is science is not science at all. It's religion of what they've been taught and repeating that over and over and over again and not willing to step outside of the own religion of science. And of course, there are people within the community that are stepping out, but most of them won't allow it. So <laughs> these are the original Jedi on Earth. 
Okay. These were actual beings on earth. This is not mythology. These were actual beings living on earth and ruling, but at a much higher capacity. So the originals were Osiris, his real name, just so you guys know, these are all Greek names. Okay. Their actual names were Ozar, Hercules. You've all heard the myths of Hercules and the fantastic experiences and processes of Hercules. Well, there's a lot more truth than you may know. Hercules was called Heru Ur or Heru the Great. This was the original. This is not Horus. Okay. Horus the Younger came much later. So the original beings on earth were, oh, I'll just call them by their Greek names Osiris. Hercules, Set, also known as Satanaku, Isis, which real name was Est, with a crown, with a throne on her head. She was the symbol of the throne and royalty. Nephthys, her sister, and Anubis or Enpu. And the truth is, Anubis was actually uh, the child of Nephthys, and Horus came later as a child of Isis and Osiris. Okay, and we need to understand that originally Osiris was the image of all things good. You could call him uh, the one of the left-hand path. And that's why when you look at every statue of ancient Egyptians that followed the Osirian, Osarian way, their left foot is forward. Every single statue, except for those who followed Satanaku or Set which is also where the word Satan comes from. That was the dominant masculine, cut your head off, destroy, follow me, control path. And then the left-hand path was loving and nurturing and educating and teaching humanity how to evolve. So we need to understand that first, Ptah ruled for 9,000 years after a period of time. Osiris ruled for about 350 years. Osiris dedicated his rule to traveling around the world and educating the Atlantean colonies because there was a lot of loss of knowledge and wisdom and energy back then. You see, Atlantis fell. And when Atlantis fell, there were Atlantean colonies around the world, which is why we find the same buildings and temples in Central America, South America, China, Bosnia, Egypt, Americas. We'll find stone circles, buried stone circles, and we'll find advanced levels of obvious technology. Anchor Wat, Indonesia, and pyramids that have recently been discovered. These were all Atlantean colonies. But when you got to understand that we have a solar year and then we have a galactic year. And just like there is night and morning and day, okay, just like, you know, the sun goes down and sets and we're in a period of darkness and then the sun rises again and then it gets to its peak and then it falls. That same scale that we see every day, as above, so below. On a small scale, the microcosm is also happening on a macrocosmic scale. Every 26,000 years, we're going through this process of falling asleep, going into darkness, and then eventually waking up and moving into a golden age. And these records, as they were taught by the Brahmins, you know, you go read the Upanishads and read the Vedas and the ancient teachings of the Hindus. They're talking about the very specific ages and they have their own names for them, where we are within these ages and when we're going to wake up and be in a golden age once again. So Atlantis was in a golden age. There were four root races, four different bloodlines that we have. Yes, this whole bullshit story of out of Africa is completely false. Completely false. Okay, present day anthropology will prove it. And I can show you guys tons of that information, but it's completely false. We weren't all black people running around Africa and then left and then, oh, I'm not in the sun as much. So now I'm white and I'm not in the sun as much. So now I'm Asian. Uh, that makes sense. I'm not, uh, not as much sun. So now I'm a red skin Indian. Like what? Seriously? 
No. In the beginning, the black race first was created. Man, I'm going off on creation stories now. And then the bringers of the dawn, the Asians. And then after the sun had risen, the red-skinned people, which were mostly were the Egyptian people. Okay, and we see the depictions of these individuals. And then at noon, the white race was created. And this is the story as the Egyptians tell it. But even back in Atlantis, we had black, Asian, red and white human beings living in harmony in a golden age, loving each other, each one having very specific genetic codes and information that blessed all of humanity. The black race has information that if we tune in to them can help lift us up. And same with the Asian race and same with the red race, Native American cultures and their wisdom and same with the white race. And so this whole division of races is because when Atlantis fell, they made a decision to move the Asian peoples into a certain area of earth and the black people into certain areas of earth and the red people into certain areas of earth and the white people into certain areas of earth. But all of them and the original primordials, the ones who created the black and Asian and red and white, all went to Egypt. Okay, four races, that takes eight primordial individuals, immortal, original creators of the races. And if you go back to Egypt and find out, there was a city called the City of Eight, Net Zemenu, the City of Eight. And this is where these individuals went. And of course, they continued to propagate and have black, Asian, red, and white children. And they all lived in Egypt in harmony for many tens of thousands of years. And this is why when you go to Egypt and I point these things out, it's obvious. There were pharaohs that were Asian and they have Asian eyeballs and they look like Asians. And you, all I got to do is say, see, there's a pharaoh, a king that was Asian, king and queen, Asian. You see that one? That was the black king and queen. They got the big nostrils, the big lips. They look like black people. It's obvious. And of course, all the black people are like, see, they were black. But the Asians could be like, see, they were Asians. And then you will see pharaohs and statues of white men with blue eyes. You know how, how much work it takes to carve a statue and then make actual eyes that look exactly like human blue irises? You know how much work that takes? I've never seen anything since ancient Egypt that has produced something so clear and so obvious. And yet you go into the Egyptian museum and you will see with your own eyes, blue eyed rulers. So we need to get over this race thing and we need to start opening up and having deeper conversations of our true history. But this guy, Osiris traveled the world. He went to Australia. He brought back artifacts of Australia and you can see boomerangs and you can see images of kangaroos on some of the artifacts in the Egyptian museum. I take people around and show them this and it's just like, holy shit, they got boomerangs in, in the museum. And then you go to Gosford and you'll see two brothers that actually inscribed into the rock walls the story of their travels with Osiris to this location to keep educating the local people in Australia. And they did the same thing around the world. Osiris traveled with musicians, singing songs across the ocean in ocean bearing vessels. He was the absolute representation of love and happiness and teaching. And there were no weapons and no military. Imagine traveling around the world with no weapons and no military. And while he was gone, his brother, Heru Ur, or Hercules, kept the peace in the situation of Egypt intact the way it had been established for human beings to be supported, for human beings to be educated, for human beings to become activated to their highest potential until this guy stepped in, who was also one of the brothers. He was also one of the great Dejed 
warriors, but he lived very differently. And he decided he wanted to change things. And so he, when his brother returned and was welcomed, cut him into 14 pieces and distributed those pieces throughout Egypt and changed everything and wanted to enslave humanity and suppress and kill off a level of humanity. Okay, and these stories play into, if you go back to the Sumerian text and the cuneiform tablets and look into Zachariah Sitchin, the 12th planet, and all the records from those things, it's exactly the same. It's just different names of these originators. But when Set took over, he changed everything. And true evil was established in Egypt. Everything changed. And there were a lot of individuals there that are like, oh, shit, we just have to live because this guy was the most powerful and demonic type of guy that if you didn't agree with him, he'll just cut you into pieces and send you somewhere else. And so eventually Isis, the mother of all healing arts, an amazing Dejed healer magician woman, brought about a situation with Osiris's dead body and actually was able to get enough of his seed and genetic code to impregnate herself and bring about a situation of Horus, Heru, which is Heru is where the word hero comes from. That's where the word hero comes from, Heru, because he came back and avenged his father. And then Heru ruled. Horus ended up completely overcoming his uncle, Set, did not kill him, okay, but overcame him and had him imprisoned through legal means of the council that existed back then. And they banished him to a very specific location. <laughs> and then he ruled for many, 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 many years. And then if you track the king's list after Horus ruled, it was called Heru Jemzu, or the friends of Horus. So every ruler had to swear allegiance to the way of Horus to maintain the good and maintain the peace for some however many thousand odd years. Well, then eventually that faded. And then eventually you have actual names of Seti the first and Seti the second and rulers who follow the ways of Set started to come back in and change things. And eventually, I believe that the followers of Set, which is where Sith Lord comes from. So when we think of it in, for, in the terms of Jedi and Sith Lords, there is this division of actual good people and bad people in the cosmos. And I believe we've been living in a situation here on Earth, completely suppressed, disempowered, dethroned human beings ruled by these dark Sith lords, essentially. And we are coming into a time where the sun is starting to rise and we're going to start remembering. So the creator of Star Wars, George Lucas, has often expressed how he turned to ancient mythology and religion for inspiration, basically taking ancient concepts and redefining them for the purpose of creating the themes, storylines, and characters in the Star Wars movie. Now, here's a really interesting piece, and I'm surprised it was even released. Okay, Dr. Hawass goes down into a new discovery in between the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid of a shaft that was discovered. Now, imagine we're just at the top of the shaft. So they find this shaft, and there's this huge carving in solid bedrock that goes straight down, and then it goes into a corridor, and they open up this big corridor. And then there's another shaft that goes down, another 12 meters it looks like. Another 12 meters goes down, and then multiple corridors open, and they go into this other room. This is really far underneath the Giza Plateau, chiseled supposedly with some, you know, copper little chisels and pickaxes all the way down into this massive corridor and then they discover another shaft descending and they get to the bottom of this shaft and this shaft has pillars and it's immersed in water and it has a sarcophagus 
and it has the inscriptions of being the sarcophagus of Osiris. And so Hawass takes people into it and opens up and on a television show live to the public says, we found Osiris's tomb. Hold on a second. <laughs> Back up the truck. Because you guys have been saying for the last however many years that everything beyond 4500 BC is myth. Osiris is a myth. Set is a myth. That's all mythology. And you're saying now you found a physical tomb of a mythological figure? Huh, interesting. So what I'm telling you is they actually found the tomb of Osiris. And this thing is much, much, much older than you can possibly imagine with these four great pillars, potentially even made out of uh, some type of material or stone that isn't even from this planet. And in fact, the Ben-Ben stone, also called the Pyramidian, that has been discovered, covered in pure gold that was the cap of the pyramid, was not even from this planet. It was from completely a different planet. And they, they know this. You can look this up. So many of the knives and tools, Tutankhamun had an actual knife that is not from this planet. And of course, they have their descriptions and reasons and discount it as much as they can. So what is the force? Obi-Wan Kenobi in the fourth episode, A New Hope, the first movie that came out, explains the force to Luke as an energy field created by all living things. You have an energy field that surrounds you. That's a fact. It's referred to as your aura. Okay. And it's like a toroidal field that exists around us. And there are processes by which you can expand and amplify your toroid field through exercise, through quality nutrition, through sun gazing, through grounding, through many different means. And in fact, some people claim to have the ability to actually see your aura. Okay. I believe that's true. I can see people's aura as well, but not physically with my eyes. I perceive it in a very different way. But the truth is we do have this field that lives around all living things. It surrounds us, penetrates us, and binds the galaxy together. Jedi and other force users access the force with the help of midichlorians, microscopic organisms inside of their cells. This is how it's talked about in the movie Star Wars, but I want to show you how these things physically exist and how some people actually have more than others and how to amplify these things. The force and the philosophies of its followers has a resemblance to a number of real world religions, including Hinduism, which includes a belief of unifying Brahman energy like the force and Zoroastrianism. Even this name, Ozar, Ozar, Estrianism. Est was the wife of Ozar. Ozar and Est, Ozoroastrianism, is the teachings of Osiris and Isis. That's what the whole religion is, Ozar-Estrianism, which centers on the conflict between good God, like the light side of the force, and evil God, like the dark side. Gods, higher beings, whatever you want to call them. This entire religion teaches that, there, you know what, there's a God of this world that is good, and there's a God of this world that is bad. And right now, I think we all know who's ruling this world. And what does this God do time and time and time and time again and has sworn to? And this is written on cuneiform tablets. It's written in many places. Every so often, his goal is to cull most of the population of Earth, to kill off as many humans as possible and get it down to very few again and then start over. He's willing to deal the, the, this God of the, the world is willing to deal with a small number, but doesn't want it to get out of control. And he doesn't want our race to go galactic, cosmic. Because just like every other race, once we hit a certain point of our evolution, then we can move beyond just this world and travel also to other locations and places throughout the cosmos, just like it shares in Star Wars. This is just a quote I wanted to put on here. Shows Osiris sitting on his throne. It says, evil starts with self-neglect. 
And if that's true, you can see how easy it is to cultivate evil within yourself. Because once you start to embody and start to neglect yourself and start to take on practices that are evil, that little bit of evil in us starts to grow. Now, I believe that all of us have light and dark. And I believe that we should love the dark sides of ourselves, but also have it under control. And what that means is sometimes we think bad thoughts, sometimes we do bad things, but essentially to grow through our experience and learn and learn how to control my own thoughts and control my own life and end up being of service to humanity and do good things to people. And yes, sometimes I make mistakes, but reviewing those mistakes and doing my best to constantly evolve. And most of that starts with yourself, loving yourself, nurturing yourself, building yourself up. So we have Set, this is how he's depicted in ancient Egypt. We have the devil as he's depicted by a lot of things today, or Satanaku, Satan. And then in the uh, series of Star Wars, we have Darth Maul, or these individuals. And all of the dark Sith Lords or dark wielders of the force all have the same color lightsabers, staffs, and other things, which is red. And there's a reason for that. And I want to get into that. But even the simple things, you know, you look at the Padawan, the young Padawans of the Star Wars series, they all have this little lock that represent when they're in training. And you go back to the ancient Egyptian statues and you'll see they always have this little lock of hair to the, off to the right side of the body, off to the right side of the body, which means they're in training to the right-hand warrior path. That's what that represents. And these things have been around for thousands of years, and somebody's actually just brought these things back. So I'm taking way more time than I wanted to, and I don't really care because I'm just flowing and I'm just having fun. So if we end up taking forever, whether you guys come to my program or not is besides the point. I just like sharing. So in this series, they have a method by which they can take a blood sample and test and test your midichlorian count to see if you will be able to have gifts, gifts of seeing the future, gifts of insights, gifts of telepathy and the transmission of ideas. Now these, we have 12 cranial nerves that exist. And if you look into the science, all you gotta do is look up science, 12 cranial nerves. What you will discover is that the cranial nerves are directly uh, linked to the senses that we have. And they're listed. But as you know, there's only five of the senses that are known about. So one of the cranial nerves is for smell and sight and sound and taste and touch. And they list those five as such, but then they stop there. And the truth is the ancient Egyptian teachings, I can show you all 12, of our senses. Every individual has all 12. To what degree do you have the ability to smell? To what degree do you have the ability to see and to hear and to feel? Some people are different. Some people have bad visions. Some people have bad hearing. Some people, some of these things aren't tuned in. And what you need to understand is that we need to enhance the foundational senses in order to get into the higher senses. Some people are naturally gifted with telepathy. Some people are naturally gifted with telekinesis. Telekinesis is a proven fact, by the way. Scientists have developed uh, what's called a little foil sail. They'll fold tin foil into a certain way and put it on a pinwheel and put a glass and they'll fully seal it so nothing can make that pinwheel turn and they'll set it on a desk and with time and distance and training, you can get it to turn. With your mind, you can get this little tin foil thing to turn. If you don't believe me, look into this. There's been other people that have created this method. They teach the method. Now they're developing technologies. You can use your mind to play games and use the force of this to do interesting things. The point that I want to make is if we have a sense that can move even a little tiny piece of tin foil. Is it possible to enhance the sense 
so that I can lift a solid weight with my mind. And if I can move something small, can I move something big? And if I can move something big, can I move something massive? And then it just comes about what degree of ability do each and every one of us have? And how do we go about the process of enhancing these senses to the point where we can actually use it? And of course, you want to take people through a process that would weed out all the dark Sith Lords. Because the last thing you want to do is teach people with service to self who could be potential murderers and rapists, these types of processes of which have all been completely lost to us, probably for a good reason through dark times. So this is a quick video I just want to play that is actually a part of, you know, talking about these little midichlorians. And give me a moment to take a drink and rest my voice box. <laughs> Stay still, Ellie. Let me clean this gut. There's so many. Do they all have a system of planets? Most of them. Has anyone been to them all? Hmm. <laughs> Not likely. I want to be the first one to see them all. Annie! There's no Ow! There we are. Good as new. Annie! I'm not gonna tell you again. What are you doing? Checking your blood for infections. Go on. You have a big day tomorrow. Sleep well, Annie. Obi-Wan? Yes, Master. I need an analysis of this blood sample I'm sending you. Wait a minute. I need a midichlorian count. The reading is off the chart. Over 20,000. Even Master Yoda doesn't have a midichlorian count that high. No Jedi has. What does that mean? I'm not sure. So I just want to share that little clip. Do you think it's by accident that the actual powerhouses, power producing cells of the body just happen to be called mitochondrians? It's kind of a, it's very close in the name, isn't it? And in fact, every cell of your body contains these little power plants. Um, and some would even say have their own level of consciousness and ability. And they are, let's just read it. A mitochondrion is a double membrane bound organelle found in the eukaryotic organism, which is you. Mitochondria generate most of the cell's supply of adenosine triphosphate, subsequently utilized as a source of chemical energy. Uh, using the energy of oxygen released in aerobic respiration at the inner mitochondrial membrane. So every single one of us has mitochondria inside of our cells. Okay, everybody does. If you didn't, you wouldn't have energy and be able to live. But some people, you can actually test, have much higher degrees of mitochondria than others, naturally. And then there are very specific processes that we can go about that not only increase the size and, and production of energy, but also it, uh, it increases the quantity. So there are things that we can do that will increase the quantity of, of these mitochondria inside of every cell of the human body and allow them to produce a lot more energy. Now we need to understand that the current human being has about a half of a volt of electricity per cell. And you also have nearly a hundred trillion cells inside of your body, which means there's an energy capacity of about 50 trillion volts of electricity available at any given time, according to the current science. And it's just, you know, it blows my mind. Like, obviously when you look inside of the brain, when we're thinking and performing different acts, you can see 
the light and the energy and the lightning and things that are taking place. And we see what human beings already have the capacity for. But what if we could increase this energy? And that's where this man comes in. Okay. So this is a book that he wrote. This is Dr. Ramsey Salim is my teacher. He was taken into a group of individuals, very rare group that actually invited him in to teach him the foundation, truth, history, mystery, religion, physical culture, and take him through the entire process to become a Jedi warrior from the time he was a kid. Okay. Now this is the Masha, which is the warrior. And I want to teach you guys each one of the glyphs of the language, because the language of nature, the Medu Netru language of nature opens up our consciousness to more insights of everything that has been named. Even the English is, is considered the tongue of angels. And it was an evolutionary process to get to the point of speaking English or tongue of angels. And I will show you guys the letter A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. All of the Egyptian hieroglyphs are directly related to the English lettering system. Okay. And when you actually write the different letters, you'll, you'll start to know that it's a direct correlation with English. And then when you say your name, Tyler, and you write it in hieroglyphs, you'll have a deeper understanding of what your name actually means. And when you truly understand something that is named and the energy and vibration of that thing, you'll realize that there's a lot of wisdom and understanding to be gained. And you can truly start to understand the names of things. And you might even rename some things. So this is Masha, is the warrior, the like the Jedi, in the great house. This was called Per X, Per Ok. And so this is where the word Pharaoh comes from, Per Ok, Pharaoh. Ok, so when the individuals came to Egypt and they said, oh, who lives in that great house, the big house? They said, oh, they thought they were just saying, what is that? And they said, well, that's the Pero or Perok. And so the individuals were like, oh, the name of the king must be Pharaoh. No, they were just saying that's the great house. Anyways, a lot to learn. So this is my teacher. These are the symbols of the Jedi order. And just notice what you notice here. I just simply put the symbol over here. Faded it out a little bit. The original symbol was that of the falcon. Okay. And the <laughs> lightsaber at the center here starts with your heart. Your heart is the main generator of energy that lights you up. <clears throat> These are just some of the books that this individual has written about the entire language, power of prayers, the original Pauti, the Enneagram, ancient Egyptian mathematics, tree out of the immortals, whole history, Egyptian book of life. So that's the book of the dead translated the way it's supposed to be. Tablets of destiny, Egyptian rituals, ancient herbology, and just this one book alone. If you open this book up and see all the different modalities of healing and the knowledge of herbology and face reading and iridology and all the things that they taught, you'd be absolutely dumbfounded. Years of learning from one of these books. And so there are some tools I just want to mention. I'll get into some other things and then hopefully we can wrap this up. But this Dejed pillar was like a capacitor, an energy amplifier, okay? And if you guys ever have a chance to go out and look at a bunch of power lines, like big power station, you'll end up seeing these capacitors that are put onto the wires. And a lot of times they were in fours. Now you might see six or eight of them or something like this. But this capacitor, now when I was in, when I was in the temple, close to the Ozarian and giving the Egyptologists the truth about how old it was and why everything was built the way that it was built. There's laser etched 
flower of life, literally laser etched into pure granite. There's 500 ton stone that is the ceiling, 500 tons, which today we can't even lift 500 tons and transport. That was the ceiling. Not only that, there was another 500 ton block on top. So the ceiling of the Ozarian temple was a 500 ton block with another 500 ton block on top of it. And it was a massive temple underground and that's the entire ceiling. And then we find out that these stones came from Aswan because you can, you can test it and find out where they came from, which is some, you know, four or 500 kilometers away. Perfectly put together. And then in the temple next to this, while everybody was going upstairs, our guide was saying, hey, come upstairs. We're going to show you the Zodiac, this big thing on the ceiling. It's beautiful and amazing. A little bird spoke to me, as they do all the time. And as we were about to go up the stairs, it said, don't go upstairs, go that way. And so I like, oh, okay. And I just walked and I started to go the other way. And then three or four other people kind of saw me dip out. And so they followed me. And they're like, where are you going? I was like, I don't know, but I meant to come over here. And so I walked into this room and there was a big metal crate on the ground. And some of these people, you could talk to them, you could ask them. The people that came on the tour with me would verify this. And they're like, oh, it's locked. You can't go in. And something said, just try it anyway, because it looked like it had a padlock on this massive thing. And I went up and it just lifted right up. And I went underground. The thing you got to understand is every single temple that's on the Nile, aside from the Nile, every temple is built on top of an older existing temple, built on top of an older existing temple, built on top of an older existing temple back tens of thousands of years. Because the Nile every year would flood and inundate and bring the black sands all over the entire land, burying everything over the years and years and years. And so they would level it off, build another temple on top. And over the years, it would build up and they'd level it off and build it on top. And this is one of the temples that's just directly underneath the temple that's there. And yet you look at it. So if you ever go to Egypt and look at all of the hieroglyphs on the above ground temples, they are completely different than the hieroglyphs that are underneath in this other temple. And when you go into this one, it's the carving, the way that it feels, the ancient way that they did it is completely different. And what we see on the wall here, and I got videos and I got photos of this entire wall and all the things that were there and could read a lot of the hieroglyphs and information that's there. And you can see one of the young the Jedi in training, little Padawan here, and you can see others and they have this big tool. What is it? And you need to understand that whenever they used a snake, they were depicting energy because a snake can run really fast across the desert, but it has no legs. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy. And if you have a lightsaber and you light it up, it looks like wong. It looks like it's turning on like the snake like energy. But they had these tools that required an energy source, which is like a battery. They had wires running to it. And then it was these big tools to do something with, which we can get into another time. And even these batteries have been discovered all across. Uh, these were actually even discovered in Baghdad. It's called the Baghdad battery. Look it up. And I'm telling you, thousands of years ago, they had batteries that you can look and they had actual copper and other coils inside of these big clay pots that were obviously batteries well if they have batteries they had electricity right and if they had electricity what were they using electricity for and then you start to question things and look into things and realize everything we've been told about our past and history is complete lie and they'll do everything they can to suppress it all you got to do this is one tool used in for very specific reasons that I wanted to talk about, but I'll end up going off for another 20 minutes just on that. But if you just move this to this side, this is, and make it smaller, this is the hilt. 
And this is a lightsaber. This is the hilt. If you look at the lightsabers that are used in the Jedi movie, you can see look a lot like this thing. And so these tools used together is about a process of building ourselves up, building our own energy. And part of this capacity can literally play into things that have been talked about. If you ever read, anybody ever read Autobiography of a Yogi? I don't know if you've ever looked into the ancient yogis. Uh, Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda was the yogi from India that came to the United States and shared yoga with the West. Nobody had ever heard of yoga until Paramahansa Yogananda brought it to the West. Paramahansa Yogananda was of an order. Yeah, exactly. Michael Perlin's holding it up right there. You got to understand there were true sages and the Jedi masters, mostly from the healer magician path that passed these traditions throughout time. So Yo Paramahansa Yogananda's teacher, uh, Lahiri Mahashai, and then Babaji and these other individuals, if you look into it, they were the immortals of those traditions and sharing this information throughout time. Now, Lahiri Mahashai told Yogananda, when he was young, you are going to be the one. I've, I can see the future. Why? Because he's got a high midichlorian count and he's a Jedi. And some of them have the capacity to see the future. Just like Anakin Skywalker in the movie, he's like, oh, he's got 20,000 midichlorians. That's more than Master Yoda. He has the ability to see the future. And what led Anakin Skywalker, Annie Kin, by the way, all the papyrus were the papyrus of Annie. And this plays into Anunnaki. And Annie Kin, Kin means the family of Ani, which were these original creators that came in. So even in the movie, Anakin Skywalker, they're even telling you the kin of Ani, Skywalker, the one that comes from the clouds. <laughs> like all this symbology. Once, if you guys decide to come through this course and learn so many aspects of this and then go back and watch Star Wars, you'll just be like, holy shit, this has been here all along, like some profound symbology. So I wanted to share one piece that as individuals get to the higher degrees of sage, we have within us, there are nine bodies that exist within the human experience. One of these bodies is called the Ka. It's represented by the falcon. And when you die, I got these little jars, four little jars called the Sons of Heru or canopic jars. When an individual in Egypt would die, they would take out their small intestines and put it in a jar with a falcon head. Take out the liver and put it in a jar with a human head. And take out the lungs and put it in a jar with a baboon head. And I want to go into the history of why. And when things really open up, you guys are just going to shit your pants <laughs> And if you have the capacity to stick around long enough and not fall asleep and actually maintain a level of energy, and if you practice the things that I give you with nutrition and movement and everything else, energy becomes too much. Then you got to actually focus on being able to bring it down and concentrate it because some people do go off the Richter. Okay. And it's very important to follow a certain path and teachers because some people just blast into the cosmos and then go get all the downloads at once and then they're at completely knocking futs legit okay and that's fucking nuts they go completely crazy but that's because they're actually receiving so much truth but they can't control it so at a level of capacity, when we cultivate the Ka within our own bodies, this is talked about by Paramahansa Yogananda, this is talked about all the greatest sages and masters of the East and other times, we have the capacity, the Ka is considered our body double. And as we amplify and build the Ka, we can project it. You can actually take your body double either while you're sleeping or meditating, 
or consciously awake, but in a higher state, use that ka to go out and actually do things. And if you read Paramahanta Yogananda's work or any others, you'll discover that some of the greatest teachers of humanity were one time just like asking questions and wanting to learn more. And all of a sudden, somebody would show up and be like, hey, if you want to know more, come to India, come to this place, and I will teach you the ways of the ancient the Jedi way, whether they called it that or not. Yogi, whatever they want to call it. Union. Okay. Union with what? Okay, because when you're conscious of the mitochondria within your body, those are connected to everything within the cosmos, union with everything throughout the cosmos, starting with yourself. First, we have to go within to be able to truly go without. But these individuals would then be like, oh, my God, okay, I'll come and learn. And they would go directly to India. They would find the place where the master was. And the master was there sitting, meditating the entire time, teaching his students. And he'd get there and be like, how the hell did you get here before me? And all the students would be like, what do you mean? He's been here the whole time. He never left. And it, he'd be like, what? And because the individual was ready to receive and start to be shown, there are things outside what we're currently taught. This specific area of Luke Skywalker as a sage who's gone out into an island to live by himself and live on very specific things, and it shows it. Land of milk and honey ends up doing battle with this individual who's turned to the dark side. And what happens is all of the, the alliance, essentially, that are against the empire and the dark lords are surrounded by the empire and they're going to be destroyed. So Luke Skywalker comes in and stands in front of everybody by himself. And they have all these huge machines with weapons. And he's so pissed. He's like, kill him. And all of them are shooting. And there he is standing out like in the desert and all these getting shot by everything. And then finally, the head like general's like, stop. You think it's enough? And when the dust settles, he's still standing there. And then this happens. And I want you to watch it. It's important. I'll destroy her and you and all of it. No. Strike me down in anger and I'll always be with you. Just like your father. So what that's depicting is Luke Skywalker projecting his ka, obviously meditating and showing up right when he was needed because this guy was going to decimate all of the, basically the rebellion that was against the empire. And by showing up and going through this process gave them enough time essentially to escape. A few known trained Jedi from history. 
So this is what originally got me turned on really big time to the ancient Egyptians is most people aren't aware, but the father of medicine, Hippocrates, traveled to Egypt and trained for seven years because it was seven years to become a physician. Okay. Plato, this man here, went to Egypt for 12 years. I wonder if I got some time frames. Yep. For 12 years. Now, Plato was the one who ended up going back to Greece, changing, creating democracy and laws and, and situations of exchange and implementing what he learned in Egypt to completely change the world as we know it to the West. Plato wrote the Timaeus and the Critias and plays and fully opened up about what he learned in ancient Egypt. He was sworn to secrecy. He was sworn to never share this information, but thank God that he did. And you can go buy his play, the Timaeus and the Critias, and he opens up and describes Atlantis. He said, the Egyptians came from an original place called Atlantis, shared to me by the high priest Manetho. And they were an enlightened civilization with Atlantean colonies around the world. And, event, and he described the mountains and the concentric rings and how it all worked. He had an advanced knowledge of all of Atlantis called Etel Enti by the Egyptians. Described everything about it. And of course, you know, people read it and they're like, oh, it's just fantasy. Just like everything else. But he fully opened up and shared the truth of it. At 12 years, he was a great master. Did many things. These are like the originals, but the true the Jedi master was Pythagoras. Pythagoras went there at 18 years of age and left when he was 40. He was the greatest known individual of the West at the time, like the smartest, most amazing individual, went to Egypt because nowhere else could he learn. He was smarter than everybody else. When he went to Egypt, he was denied three times. And then he was tested. They put him on trials. He was tested. He had to fast for an extended period of time and go through pretty advanced levels. But the fasting was there to get him out of his head and into his heart. Because you can't learn the true teachings of Egypt if you're doing it from here. It has to be done from here. And he stayed for 22 years becoming a, an actual master de Jedi. Like actual de Jedi. And when he went back to Greece at 40, he was called the father of numbers and the father of geometry. He opened up something called the Pythagorean Academy and started educating and teaching a few. But he also entered in his 40s, the Greek Olympics and ended up winning three years in a row, beating the greatest of gladiators from around the world in his 40s, absolutely decimated and destroyed anybody in his path. Only a true de Jedi could do that. <laughs> Legit. And he was teaching secrets to the few, but obviously there were enemies. The state did not like this guy. Okay. They came in and actually burnt the Pythagorean Academy and everybody in it because of the truth and the teachings and the opening up. And I could tell you guys endless stories, and I will, about how this guy would go about going out into the world and recruiting people, the things that he could do. The stories are true. And I know because I know when truth is spoken and written because I can feel it all through my being. And I look forward to a time when I can share this information. So the Jedi training is the ancient Egyptian physical culture. It's sharing the basics. Now I need to tell you that I went through three years, three degrees of training. OK, and my choice was mostly the the physician's path, the education, the learning and the detoxification, the herbology and iridology and sclerology and acupressure and reading heartbeat, all the things about the healer's path. But I also received a foundation in the ancient Egyptian physical culture and martial arts, OK, of which I haven't kept up to. Until recently, where I'm starting to reintegrate these things, but there's very specific ways to stretch. Sesh 
is originally what Osiris taught to the Brahmins, and they call it yoga. And there are different forms of this. And of course, they incorporate sasenthi, breathings, kanti, just postures, but they really leave out a lot of usurti, which is the strengthening. So there's the left hand path and the right hand path. And then the culmination of all of it, which is the martial arts. And so what I do on a daily basis is guide people through a process. It's five days a week. Three of those days a week, I'm specifically working with people live to go through all of this in about a 90 minute window, sometimes about two hours, but people get on with us five days a week and go through this process. And I'm incorporating aspects of all of this little by little by little, okay? And as the years go on, I'll incorporate more and more and more, but there's some profound aspects of this that I really want you guys to grasp. And I know I've probably taken way too long here, but the Pentagon is one of the most powerful symbols on earth. In fact, you know, this is the Pentagon in the United States considered the most powerful military on planet earth. And the Pentagon is a symbol of protection. And ultimately it is the culmination and bringing together of the five aspects of the human process of the physical culture. So when you start to do these things all together, it completes you as a five-pointed star, becoming a powerful pentagon. And then we need to be about this process of raising the Dijed pillar and embracing these symbols within us. This is an image of Pita. Pita was the first ruler of ancient Egypt that ruled for 9,000 years. And of course, he had another name in the Sumerian side of things. But he was here to protect humanity and to dispel the information that humans need to be able to ascend. And we can see the Uwaz scepter or Uwasti. We can see the Dijed pillar and the Ankh all being used together in an external device. And then you start to ask questions. How did they move stones? How did they cut stones? How did they stack stones? How did they build? You know, it wasn't a bunch of slaves being whipped, pulling ropes. All that's complete nonsense. Completely nonsensical. So there is a purification process that we can go through, bringing night into day. This was called the Rainbow Bridge. The book of coming forth by night into day. From being in a state of sleep into a state of being awake. Okay. And this is symbology that's literally externally, you can see it. I saw this yesterday. Yesterday, just down the street was a tornado. Landed. It was ripping apart houses right across in the other suburb. I'm in Cedar Park, and there's a place called Round Rock, and it landed, and there's huge storm came through. And when it cleared, a massive rainbow. After all the destruction and the shit that happens, the rainbow comes in, and then new light and new life and new information. And I, I want to go into the depth of the symbology, but I don't have time. Hopi prophecy. This is the Native American tribes that have passed this tradition for thousands of years state. When the earth is ravaged and the animals are dying, a new tribe of people shall come into the earth from many colors, classes, creeds, and by their actions and deeds shall make the earth green again. They will be known as the warriors of the rainbow. The warriors of the rainbow are the ones who will go through this process of transitioning through this rainbow bridge purification. Let's read it. A whole new generation of people will come into being and heal the planet. They will retach the values and the knowledge that has been lost in time, demonstrating how to have wisdom and extra perception and how unity, harmony, and love is the only way forward. This is the rainbow bridge. You are the rainbow bridge. You are the Dijed pillar. You are the Uwaz scepter of power. You are the Ankh. It's all within you. But we need to understand this. 
These are degrees of consciousness. And these are the seven seals of revelation. And on a pale horse he shall come, and the seal shall be opened, and plagues loosed upon the earth. All of this is prophesied in many different traditions and religions for thousands of years. And the first three seals will be like plagues loosed on the earth. And some believe we're in this now. And it's stated that the first three seals that are open, the war will be lost and there'll be pestilence. And then the fourth, then things, then all of a sudden there'll be this return, a thousand years of peace. Now this is happening, happening potentially on a macroscopic scale in our world and in our existence, but it's also happening on a microscopic scale inside of our own being and level of consciousness. And there are some people stuck here. The root chakra is all about fear and hate and service to self doing anything people can to get something for themselves, even if it hurts others, living in fear. What if I lose my job? What if I lose my house? What if I lose anything or everything and I'm willing to fight? I'm willing to potentially kill. And we might not think this, but if people are living in this level and there's catastrophe, people will go out and murder each other just to eat. Those are people living within this space. Then we have this, we have these, all of these different levels of consciousness. And then we look at this, look at the colors that are wielded by the Jedi versus these dark Sith Lords. And when we start to understand the individual Jedi who lived and maintained a level of heart, even the greatest Jedi, Yoda, one of the greatest, always stayed in that energy of the heart which is one of the most powerful, but you can move beyond into higher chakras. And there's an evolutionary process. The blue represents the throat and communication and creation. The purple represents that crown, represents the third eye, insight. And when you actually look into the stories of who these individuals are and the path that they're on and where they've gone to, you'll understand what's really going on. And you'll understand that even some individuals that have gone through the heart and are evolving, this guy, Anakin Skywalker, in the story, highest midichlorian count, ends up, he can see the future because of his gifts, but then he can see the future of his own wife dying in childbirth. He gave birth to twins, Luke and Leia, but she dies in childbirth. And because of all of the fear and all the things that happened in his life, he's tempted by the dark Sith Lord and says, hey, if you come to the dark side and learn these ways, maybe you can stop your wife from dying. You can overcome her death, which was a complete lie. It never happened. But then he fell and end up dropping back down into the root. So as long as we are in these levels of consciousness, we're, we're constantly caught up in service to self. Of course, we can evolve. And you can see, uh, you know, the energies of things that lead to this lower state, constantly living in fear and anxiety. Well, if dark Sith lords are ruling this planet, where do they want you? They want you here. And how are they going to keep you here? By constantly creating a narrative of fear and anxiety and stress in hate, in division. They want you to hate your neighbor. They want you to daub in your neighbor. They want you to be in fear of war, in fear of the virus, in fear of whatever they can. As soon as one thing starts to lose steam, it's the next agenda to put you in fear. Oh, nuclear war now. Oh shit, everybody hate Putin. And before it was the virus and the vaccines and the force mandates and the shit. Why? Why now? Because they know, they know that we've turned a corner and there is new light and we are at the dawn of the De Jedi fully waking up and regaining their power and coming together. Because right now, all I can see is the dark Sith Lords that are highly awake and conscious, but living here are unified and they have been for a very long time. 
and they do not want to lose this planet. They do not want to lose control. And that's why they're pulling out every stop and trying to inject and modify your genes and change you and completely screw everything that we have access to. And we need to become aware that when we change into service of self, service to others, from service to self, that's when you know on some level you've crossed a threshold. But you also need to be aware at any point based on fear, anxiety, sexual dysfunction, you know, there's, there's things we need to learn at every aspect of this. First, it's overcoming basic fear of survival. Then it's all about our sensuality and sexuality and creative expression. And that can be beautiful and it can be good and we can go through that or it can lead to dysfunction and weird. All of a sudden, you know, people end up going off on the sexual side of things and taking it to the levels that maybe are not the greatest <laughs> use of that energy. Okay, and then we get into willpower and creation and manifestation. We learn how to create. And once you learn to create and develop and grow and build business and do things and start to receive wealth, then your power to create can also stay positive and assisting humanity and stepping into service to others or the opposite. I want more and you become greedy and then you want to own and control and become a multi-billionaire and use that money for you, you and yours and nobody else's. And there's, so there's always these chances to truly become service to self, dark, create negative karma and be in this energy. And only truly when we open the seal of the heart and truly move beyond and get into a situation of truly loving ourselves, truly loving every human, recognizing that every single human is a reflection of myself. And so to hate anyone or resent anyone or hold shit against anyone is to hate and resent yourself. And as you move through the heart chakra and open to higher degrees, you will change your reality. Every human being you come into contact with and your personal experience and guidance into places and locations and situations becomes about love, becomes about connection, becomes about co-creation, service to others, and higher levels. And we are creating a completely different reality beyond this. And we need to understand that there are people living in hell right now. And that is their reality. And people living at all of these degrees on this earth. And we need to find out where we are and be focused on evolving upwards. <laughs> it's time. It's time to commit and focus and at least get to this. And I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. There's the, the Jedi path, which is upward ascent. And there's the dark Sith set Satanaku path, which is the descent. And you need to understand that you can be at a high level of consciousness and still be here. There are degrees of humans within these that are asleep and awake. And the ones that are truly high levels of consciousness and existing here, it's, it's not a pretty sight. They might put on a good front in a show, but behind the scenes, it's a dark situation. And if you actually knew what's going on on planet Earth in some places around the world where these people get together, you would probably curl up in a ball and cry for a long time. But it's not about focusing on that. It's about focusing on this because one individual living up at this level balances out millions and millions of people living at lower levels. And all we need is enough momentum of human evolution 
to take this to a completely different realm and level. Because what is above this? This is. But on a higher frame. We repeat the process, but beyond this three-dimensional experience. So I ask the question, were these just like temples where priests are going and worshiping dog-headed gods? <laughs> no. These were the schools and training centers. See this guy here? See these guys here? They were showing us what they were doing. Left foot forward, the feminine healer path, the way of Osiris, the way of education. They were standing on granite, which charges their body. They were holding golden bars full of crystal, a very specific crystal that by breathing and toning and opening was charging the crystal and charging the body. Okay. This is the building of the electromagnetic energy. The first ritual of which builds the energy in the heart. So this is me and my father. This is one of the statues and you can see the bars that are being held. Okay. You can see the crown that's on the head. You go out into every temple of ancient Egypt, and these are the statues you see at the front, because this is the first initiation. Initiation. This is the first ritual you learn to open the heart, open the heart, build the energy in the heart, build the energy in the heart, going through the purification, through the awakening, through the activation, so that then we can use that energy to heal and regenerate and then activate these other, other 11 out of 12. There are 12 specific ritual processes, only one of which was actually shown to the public in statues. And these statues are all around Egypt and nobody ever asked the question, what are they doing? Why are they standing left foot forward? Why are they holding these bars? Why do they all have this specific posture? What are they doing? And so if we can imagine going back, back in time when this was pure white with a golden tip, and every time the sun would shine at noon, the rays would hit the gold and send that light into all four directions as a symbol of knowledge being spread north, south, east, and west. And the purification temple, the Nile ran right in front of the Sphinx. There is a purification temple and a sphinx right next to it. Okay. All of this is buried. All of this causeway. And the sphinx is sitting on top of it. And I want to read the Stella in between the sphinx legs and tell the story about it. And there's this guy by the name of Edgar Casey called the Sleeping Prophet, who probably had a high metachlorian count and had the, the gift of insight. And so tens of thousands of people would go to Edgar Casey and receive a reading about their sickness. And he would tell them exactly what they needed to do because he was a reincarnated the Jedi healer. <laughs> and at one point, this individual had this disease and it was this reading. He'd already done thousands. And in the reading, he said, look, there was an atrocity, a negative karmic expression or something you did back in ancient Atlantis. And it was the first time he ever said Atlantis. People are like, what's Atlantis? And he did this whole reading of this lifetime. This person was in Atlantis and did something that was negative. And now, however long later, they're still living out a lifetime where they have some form of disease because they're going through the karmic expression of something that they did tens of thousands of years ago. And he says, this is what it was that you did. And here's the things you need to do to reverse the negative karma in this lifetime so that you can reverse the disease. And then eventually people started asking questions when he would go into his trance-like state and he started to describe Atlantis. And guess what? This guy's a farmer, no education. You can look into the history of Edgar Casey. It's brilliant. And in fact, today there's something called the Edgar Casey Foundation, which has all of the records of everything that he went through over the years. 
He started to describe Atlantis exactly the way Plato describes it in his play. Exactly the same. There's only two individuals that I know of in this lifetime, okay, that brought back the teachings of Atlantis was Plato originally, and then Edgar Cayce. And then Edgar Cayce described the Sphinx and how it's sitting on top of a colonnade hall that is the entrance that the initiates would go through on their journey to the Great Pyramid. And these are drawings based on what he said in his readings. And of course, modern day scientists have taken all kinds of instruments in front of the Sphinx and found there's underground passageways. And of course, what did, what did the Egyptologists do? Suppressed all the information and built a big deck and tried to cover it up. And they will never admit that there's something underneath the Sphinx, even though Hawass has gone underneath the Sphinx and he's opened the passageways. And there's photos of him going underneath. Which leads to this. What is this thing? We have a subterranean chamber. When I took a group of people, we took them all down to the subterranean chamber. And then we ascended up to the queen's chamber where we took a golden crystal bowl in there and did sound because this is a hyrosonic chamber, which builds your sound body and prepares you for the great initiation in what's called the Sekem chamber which they call the king's chamber. And what is this? This is a Dejed pillar, massive, that's sitting on top of this room called the Sekem chamber, this massive room sitting right there. This is what it looks like. And what does it do? Well, according to the Journal of Applied Physics and all the scientists that took their instruments out there and measured it, they said that there are electromagnetic properties of the Great Pyramid that has the capacity for a massive concentration of electromagnetic energy, especially in the what's called Sekhem chamber. The word Sekhem comes from Sekhmet, which was the wife of Pita. And Sekhem energy has the power to heal or the power to destroy. And if you look up Sekhmet, she's got a, a really bad history. <laughs> and it's not someone you wanted to piss off because her wrath came out. And Sekhmet was represented by a lion's head because she has courage and protection and amazing. But if you piss a lion off, it will also tear your head off and rip out your entrails. And I can tell you, across from Luxor at Karnak, when I took a group of people into the temple of Pita in Sekhmet, we went into this little temple room of Sekhmet. Holy shit, man. Everybody in our group immediately felt the power and energy inside of that room still in a broken temple where everything's rubble. But this one room's intact, and there's a statue of Sekhmet standing at one side. You walk into this room, and the energy is so strong coming from this statue, especially if you're tuned in. Literally, as every person walked in, I just observed. Okay, I'd never been in there before. I walked in. I felt this energy, and I just went to the side and stood on the side of the wall. As every person came in, they all lined up on the side of the wall and just stood there. And then one by one, starting with me, I walked out and I stood in front of the statue, just looking at it and feeling it. And the power and energy and vibration still coming off the statue. It was overwhelming. And I can tell you that there is a process and practice, if you choose to join me, that we can be about to use the bars, stand on black granite, and start to go through the process of building this energy in our heart and amplifying our electromagnetic energy. And once we hit a certain point of critical mass, that's when we need to go into the pyramid and up into the Sekhem chamber, and then have a whole nother level of electromagnetic energy downloaded that will activate us on a whole different frequency. And so that's what essentially this training is about. 
This training is a seven day program. It's a seven day process we're gonna go through. Now, I want everybody to join us as soon as possible and start the process, but then there's gonna be seven solid days where we actually go through the ancient Egyptian physical culture in the mornings. And it will be about three to four hours of physical training, but it's gonna be stretching, it's gonna be breathing, it's gonna be movement, it's gonna be connection, it's gonna be a little bit of strength training, it's gonna be dancing and moving and jumping up and down. It's also gonna be incorporating some martial arts and kicks and punches, and then some martial arts tools, a bow staff, a lightsaber, some other pieces. And every morning we're gonna spend about three or four hours just going through and, and practicing and learning so that after the program, you can continue to come back for months and years and have this area of development of the ancient Egyptian physical culture to open up your cardiovascular, lymphatic, nervous system, your endocrine system, and improve everything. The program starts on May 4th. May the 4th be with you. Ha ha. What you're going to learn? Ancient Egyptian physical culture and the five aspects. Grade one. Remember, this is this is a program to find out who actually wants to do it. That's what it's really about. If you get through the seven days, <laughs> which you will, it'll be easy enough. But if you get through the seven days and you realize this is your path, then it's going to be a seven-year process. We're going to take it slow and we're going to learn a little by little by little by little and practice little by little by little by little. And little by little, I'm going to add one and then two and then three and then four and then five up until you learn the entire 12 ritual processes to open up the 12 cranial nerves, which enhance the 12 senses. Grade one, martial arts and weapon use. Grade one, Egyptian alphabet and language. So learning the language of nature, uh, the information behind it. So there's an educational side of this. There's a physical side of this. Basic symbols of ancient Egypt and their meaning, the true history and origin of humans and where we come from, so much more. The basic seven principles of health that we need to follow. So any individual that wants to be on this path needs to embrace the laws of nature. And for some, it'll be easy. And for others, it might be very challenging to change your habits. But to be a the Jedi is not like anything you will ever come into contact with. If you were to be on another planet and walk into a bar and grab a drink and see a Jedi walk in, you're going to know who's a Jedi because of their energy and their space. And the Jedi aren't just partying and having a good time and eating hamburgers and having barbecues and smoking weed and doing stupid shit. They're committed to a process of being of service and committed to a process of life and health and regeneration and immortality. Or at least on this path of ascension, as much as possible within this lifetime. So you'll learn the seven principles of health and commit to whatever degree that you can, little by little by little. And you'll also learn the seven hermetic principles, which are the higher laws, how to regenerate and activate yourself. Very specific, how to cross the rainbow bridge because it's a very specific process over seven years. Didn't even get into that. <laughs> Totally skip that part. How to open the 12 senses. Grade one will probably be the first ritual only. If I feel like people are ready for it, we'll do two. Number one and number two, which is all about the heart and sight, and then also opening up sound. So it's the process of becoming a Jedi. Essentially, you get through the seven days and want to continue. Then you'll be starting out as a Padawan. And you might be physically already a master. You might be, you know, tapped into other things and already a master. But there's a lot to learn with details of language and history and specific processes that still makes you a Padawan. And within this tradition, we still need to learn 
aspects of all of it to be able to progress forward. First degree test. So you'll be tested at the beginning of the program or just prior on your physical ability, your flexibility, your insights. And yes, I'm talking about ability to do push-ups and ability to do the splits and ability to do a front bend and ability to kick and punch, but it doesn't matter where you're at. What matters is that you progress. And so at the end of seven days, we'll test it again. And if you actually show up, you'll be much better in all of these areas, most likely, or at least in certain areas. But then it's about continuing the process. And then in another year, we'll get together and go through a whole nother process of initiation. And we'll test where you're at. And the idea is to consistently improve. And if you are old, you will become young. And if you are feeble, you will become strong. That's what this process is about. But it's not easy. If you are committed, you will regenerate your body. You will reactivate hormones. Your cells will become younger. You will thrive. You will regenerate. You will literally get younger. Seven years from now, you could potentially be 20, 30, 40 years younger than you are now. Every cell in your body recognized as a 30, 40 year younger human being. Human, if you understand what hue is. So you'd be tested on the seven principles. You'll be tested on the original five principles and the stories of Isis and Set and Nephthys and Horus, understanding the teachings basic alphabet, physical culture. If you pass through this and you decide to do it and pass the test, then I will give you a gi and a belt. The gi will be branded in the ancient tradition, which is very specific logos. And the first belt is red. And then a year later, orange, or however long it takes. Some people might take two or three or four years just to pass the red and then orange, and then yellow, and then green, and then blue, and then purple, and indigo, mace windu. <laughs> Basic training prior and after. So you sign up for the course, you come along starting tomorrow. It'll be a great time. And I'll show up tomorrow, give you a, a definition of how things work. We'll go through the process. And then we'll continue to add a little bit, add a little bit and stay consistent. After the program is finished, we're gonna continue that training. Whether you show up one day a week, three days a week or five days a week is completely up to you. But the more you show up and be consistent with it or learn the practices and incorporate it into the practice you currently have, there'll be aspects that'll improve every aspect of what you're already doing. Okay, the seven days together is more advanced training, and it will most likely be three to four hours in the morning and probably three to four hours in the afternoon. The morning will be more so based around the physical training, and the afternoon will be the intellectual, the language, the history, the mystery, the symbolism, and everything that I want to teach you about ancient Egyptian stuff. You'll have 30 days access to the recording afterwards to watch as many times as you like, uh, which I'd recommend. If you have, you know, sons and daughters and other things of this nature, you can always bring them along and have access. This is priced at $2,222. I had insight last year that I, I have to do this. I've had insights for the last 10 years that I needed to recreate the crown of Tutankhamun. And then I had visionaries and processes. I can sh literally, I will show you images of myself as a physician at Luxor. And I look just like I do today. I'm doing exactly what I've been doing today. And I'm wearing a crown that looks exactly like this with a freaking <laughs> blue stone. And I didn't even realize that until after even making this piece and wearing it and using it at a time in my life 
where I just knew I had to recreate these bars and start using them. I had to get granite. I had to remake the crown. And there's been tools, unks, Eye of Horus and other tools that it's just, I have to make this, I have to make this, I have to make this. So I'd make a bunch of money. I find somebody to do it. And I put all my time and energy and research. I went to Egypt, got photos and measurements, the whole thing, just so I could remake the exact thing. And I haven't even talked about the energy that divides the left and right hemisphere and how we can connect and bring about a whole situation with sound, with toning, with movement, with a crown. There's a reason why kings and queens wore crowns for thousands of years. It wasn't just like, hey, look at me. I got a crown. I'm a badass. It actually served a purpose. Like an antenna, like a satellite dish tuning us in. And that's why everybody went to the king. Because he was the one that was tuned in to the divine and had the direction of where to go and what to do. And of course, over thousands of years, this became kind of lost. And then people just wore a crown like, hey, look at me. I'm the king. Do what I say or I'll cut your head off. But there's true origins and meanings behind all of these things. And so what we're doing when we're holding these bars and standing on granite and putting on a crown and breathing deeply and then toning in certain ways, we're building this energy inside of the body. We're building the nervous system. We're opening up the 12 cranial nerves. We're enhancing our senses. And yes, there's a whole slew of things we need to learn that we need to commit to tomorrow or sometime soon. The ways that the Jedi, the clothes that we wear, the chemicals that we use inside of our home, the foods that we eat, the things that we do multiple times throughout the day, different parts of the day, things that we can do. And the people who are actually fully committed to this process will, in a very short period of time, start to fully open up or open more of the gifts that we have, but also do it from a place of groundedness and foundational structure. The principles are the foundation so that when you open the higher senses, you have a process by which you can control it and not just all of a sudden go off the Richter and end up in an insane asylum somewhere. Okay, because I've done that too. I've gone 100% without laying the foundation and ended up in a fucking straight jacket in Santa Ana prison in California. Underground, fully padded room bullshit, fully tapped in. Everybody that I talked to just like, holy shit, who the hell is this guy? Like we need to get him in front of groups of people, but so far, way too far gone, way too quick. And so I've had a recovery and a slow process to build myself up before committing to the process again in a structured way so that I don't just pop. <laughs> and I'm telling you guys, each and every one of you has the capacity to be in tune with your soul 100%. The ba will descend. When this is clean and this is ready, your soul will fully be intact, manifest in the physical, in this plane. And when that happens to one human being, if it can happen to an entire community of human beings doing it together, that's what we need on this planet. Because nothing else is going to do it. Unless Jesus decides to show up, pray to God he does. But until then, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And we need to stop projecting and just waiting for our Savior to come save us. We need to save ourselves. We need to evolve and create a vibration that's ready for the second coming or whatever you want to call it. Prepare the way. I appreciate you guys. That's it. My last thing is join the De Jedi Order. Sit with me on this council. Create order and structure and light on this planet. Be the change you want to see in the world. 
let's evolve together. Let's get into this. Let's have discussions. I don't pretend to be the, the master. I'm also well and truly on this path of learning with you. I've spent many years, though, educating myself and learning. I believe I have some big pieces of the puzzle that will unlock many mysteries for you. And when the mysteries start to unlock and you become inspired and like, holy shit, what if this is true? And you start to believe in yourself and your own potential based on the truth, then you will fully become awake. Then you will fully become activated and committed to this process because you will know in your being where it's going. And it will happen with love. It will happen with compassion. It will happen with openness and community and support and healing. And I'm a believer that if we do this together, we won't have to take up the sword and chop people's heads off. I don't ever want to do that. I don't ever want to have to take another life. But I also choose to be a warrior in the garden and not a gardener in the war. So that if Satanaku's followers come to my door, they will regret it. And I'll give them every opportunity of love and peace. And if I absolutely have to, then the lightsaber will come out. And I'm hoping there will be a lot of other Jedi to join me. I love you guys. I believe you're here for a reason. Thank you so much. I see you.